And the Brits were okay with that. City of London was okay with that. Brussels was okay with that. The factions within the United States that are loyal to those two factions were okay with that. But then when it didn't work out that way, now all of a sudden it's like, well, Europe wants kind of the more we go, go, go through this, Europe more now wants to survive. They need to get Ukraine over and done with, but the Brits are going to go broke if they, if they are on the hook for all the Ukrainian debt that they've guaranteed. Uh, and the sovereigntists within the American banking system are like, yeah, no, we're not doing this because there's no, there's no upside for us here. So let's back up. Let's, let's back out of that. And now let's understand where, where we're coming from. Tom Lugando, how are you? I am good. I am good. How are good. you, Andy? Yeah. Did I uh, say your last name correctly? Because a lot of you did not, and I and and uh, and that's that's okay. I I never know whether I should like c correct people or not, especially for the first time. It's Luongo, right? Luongo. Just like the called Luongo, just like it's spelled. Um, Got it. But it's a little weird. Okay, let's spoke. Hey, yeah, like, what are we gonna do? Like, it's a it's a whole lot of vowels, and the and the and the poor world has to deal with it. So, yeah, yeah. as they said off camera, you piped on a cigar, and we rapped about this paper lighting up a smoke when i was chatting yeah, with them so uh smoke away I, it's making me want to smoke one right here so well you know i uh i i well one could argue that i built this office simply so that i had a place i had a comfortable environment to smoke without my dogs barking in the background um one could make that argument it wouldn't and you wouldn't be too far from the truth uh <laughs> that i needed a place in my drum set but other in you know half of the gaming collection so again like That's I just awesome. needed to have a place for like all of my, my, Stuff. my things. All right. So yeah. there it is. Well, Hey, I heard you're a, uh, a huge fan of Czech handguns. My wife is Czech. Um, why are you a fan of Czech handguns? Well, because well, I, I, you know, famously, um, in the before time when I actually talked about this stuff a lot more, um, my, my handgun, uh, my personal handgun of choice is a CZ 85 combat. Um, the CZ. 75 is one of the greatest handguns ever made it just is it's like the browning high power perfected ergonomically mechanically and everything else these are these are unbelievable uh, they're unbelievable handguns um they're uh, deadly accurate they're they're tight i mean they're i mean the fit and finish on my on my when i paid what five bills for this thing and with i mean with a satin nickel finish and like a whole a whole nine yards like and ambidextrous controls and all this i like and it was like 485 out the door. And I'm like, and it's got fit and finish, like, you know, uh, like a $1,500 uh, Ipsic gun, right? And, you know, competition gun. I handed it to a friend of mine when I used to work with him. Just the funny, funny, funnily enough, guy that I, I worked with who was a competition shooter. And he, and he walked around the laboratory with his, with his Dan Wesson on his hip. It was hilarious, right? But and this was the kind of place that I worked at at that time. We, we could get away with that. But I, went, I ran out to the car, brought it in. I showed it to him, and he, I handed him the gun. He's like, this thing's tighter than my, my 9. It, it rattles less than my 1911. I'm like, yeah, stainless steel, stainless steel barrel. It's a gorgeous weapon. And uh, I've had it for years, and, and it was the first gun I ever bought. And uh, I swear by them. And their, their rifles are great. Their, their handguns are amazing. And, and uh, it's that Czech steel. It's why the, it's why the Germans invaded the Sudetenland. They wanted the, they wanted the Czech iron ore. They wanted, the, they wanted that coal. Like, it's just <laughs> higher quality stuff. Yeah, that's a good explanation. I was funny. I was uh, checking out prices, actually, literally 10 minutes ago. Yeah. And I was expecting seven to $800 to $1,000. And no, you can pick the one up on a deal at 500 bucks to $600. So, yeah, I mean, I'm left-handed, so I had to get the, I had to get the, the, I had to get the 85 combat. Uh, I had to get the 85, which was, they don't make it anymore. It was ambidextrous controls. So, cause I'm left-handed. Um, so, um, but you know, the standard 75, you know, in very, in all of its flavors comes you know, with right-hand controls, but for the, the, uh, but for the, uh, for the, the safety, you know, I needed ambidextrous controls cause I'm left-handed. So, you know, my, uh, my gun shop, my local gun shop, friendly neighborhood gun shop, uh, did me right. I walked in with the un intention of spending like $1,200 on some boutique 1911. And because that's what my, that's what all of my research and due diligence told me I should buy. And then I walked in the door and, you know, the guy over at, at Pickett's Weaponry down in, down in Newberry went, you know, now you want to check out one of these and all puns intended. And he handed me the gun and I looked at it. 
this is it. Yeah, I'll buy this one. And that was that. And you know, <laughs> it was over and done with. And like the only other handgun that I mean, I own a couple of other handguns. I own some revolvers and and and, and whatnot. And mostly picked up during COVID, right? Like during COVID, my wife built bug out bags and I bought five guns. Like that's what we did during COVID, right? <laughs> we were like locked in the house, didn't have anything else to do. So I bought guns and, you know, shot in the backyard a lot. Um, put together like a scout rifle and 22 Winchester Magnum, whole bunch of stuff, right? Um, but like the only other like, like, like high, you know, I mean, you know, uh, like round gun, you know, semi automatic that I would buy would be like, one of those, uh, the Eriks are a really nice gun. So I can never remember the name of the, of the, the model, but those things were amazing too. And, and, uh, and that's an American gun. It's out of, uh, I think it's out of, they're out of Nevada on their phenomenal gun. Um, uh -huh. and, uh, off, you know, off the shelf, they're just like, just ridiculous, but yeah, I mean, it's funny. I'm a good, I'm a halfway decent pistol shot. My eyes are, my eyes have gone, uh, I'm a terrible rifle shot. I always have been. So, you know, I'm going to, you know, it is what it is. My wife used to be the good rifle shot and I was the pistol shot. So, you know, well, we it's just fun. Had, had different, he had different fields of fire covered. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's fun. So, well, let's start out with uh, diving into it is you have a thesis and I, I say thesis with all due respect. I just want to explore mm -hmm. a little bit more sure. about um, the financial and correct me and please jump in um, the financial reset or the financial control is really coming from Europe. Um, work that out for me and where in Europe, I'm assuming this is an assumption, is that London or Brussels or Zurich both. or Paris it's for both. Holland? It's really, it's really kind of both. It's, it's, it, and, the, and, and as I've gotten older or as I've gone through this and I've, and I've like worked on this idea, it's really obvious that as the closer we get to any kind of um, uh, inflection point, like we are rapidly approaching that moment where something bad is going to happen. Either the war in Ukraine is going to have to either escalate or end. There's going to be a sovereign debt crisis. It's somewhere. Um, it, 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 when you reach crisis points or when you reach inflection points, that's when you find out where everybody's differences actually lie. Right. So, you know, when it was, they were all had a plan and they were all in, and 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 they were all in cahoots on what that plan would be. And I'll get to the specifics in a second. Then the like, like the overlap of the Venn diagram of everybody's um, uh, incentives. You know, you could say, okay, well, they're all here, and they all meet in, in the middle there, and that's what we're going to do. And that was generally, hey, we're going to start a war with Russia. We're going to do, you know, we're going to uh, we're going to get the United States to fight it um after the ukrainians are, are used up and uh and then we're going to take steal all their their resources and we're going to fund the eu and all the rest of it the question then was and the brits were okay with that city of london was okay with that brussels was okay with that the factions within the united states that are loyal to those two factions were okay with that but then when it didn't work out that way now all of a sudden it's like well europe wants kind of the more we go 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 through this, Europe more now wants to survive. They need to get Ukraine over and done with. But the Brits are going to go broke if they if they are on the hook for all the Ukrainian debt that they've guaranteed. Uh, and the sovereigntists within the American banking system are like, yeah, no, we're not doing this because there's no there's no upside for us here. So let's back up, let's let's back out of that, and now let's understand where, where we're coming from. Three years ago, it, everything was on pace, right? COVID happened four years ago. COVID happened after COVID. They printed a whole bunch of money, and then they were going to push for climate change. And that's most that push for, for regulation and spending to fight clim climate change coming out of Europe. Why? Because Europe doesn't have any collateral. Why? Because Europe doesn't have any oil or coal or uranium or, any, or natural gas. They have some, but they don't have nearly enough to run their they run an economy of 600 million people, 700 million people. They just don't have it. So, and this is the age old European story of I, we will colonize the rest of the world, pay, pay pennies on the dollar or the euro or the pound or the, the franc or whatever, and then bring all those resources back to Europe and run our industrial uh, and run our, to run our industrial capacity and outcompete everybody. This is how, this is how Europe operated for, well, 500 years going into, uh, the 20th century until the United States became the industrial power of the world. Now, after World War II, Europe is bombed back to the, basically bombed back to the Stone Ages, and we have to rebuild them. 
And the, U- the U.S. is okay with that because there's a massive investment opportunity there. Now, we get into, so that's all running, right? And that whole, like, that whole system is running and it's all in cahoots, right? NATO, the Cold War, the, you know, the, the, the long-term goal was always we're eventually going to deal with Russia and we're going to break Russia up. The United States adopts Britain's foreign policy um, starting around the Wilson administration just before World War I of, yes, Russia's the problem. We want their, and we want their resources. How are we going to do this? Well, the, the Brits are absolutely the masters of the color revolution. Hell, they created it. So um, they created the, 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 you put soft power on the ground, you undermine the local government by empowering dissident groups and giving them money, building the building thing up, taking over the media. And then, and then eventually when you get to the right moment in time, when you've destabilized that country, either through both political and cultural destabilization, as well as economic destabilization, then you wait for the right moment. You put the right people in, boom, Bob's your uncle. And you can, you can create a revolution. It doesn't matter whether it's Egypt or Ukraine or Georgia or this one or that one. It's, this is the plan. And it's always been this way. And can I interrupt you? Quick? Sure. I can interrupt. Yeah. So you said something very interesting. It's like, this is the plan to destabilize and taking this to the Russian Ukraine war. You have Western Europe and the U S if you would, mm-hmm. they're, they don't want to end this war. It's obvious, but there's also this war is going on and really started it is pretty because pretty much because we want Russia's assets and that's their sure. commodity, natural resource assets. I just want clarity. That's what you're saying. Yeah. That's really what I'm talking about. Because that's where that's look, it's like Europe wants that they're, they, the, the Brits want the, the, the Brits have always wanted to extend the British empire for as long as possible. Okay. When they were a maritime empire, it worked. When they were an industrial empire, it was fine. After that, they transitioned into being a financial empire. They took their they took the wealth that they created during the during the first two hundred years of the Bank of England from sixteen ninety four right. up and through up until the end of basically Reconstruction in the United States. When Lincoln's when Lincoln, this is the interesting part about it. I'm no fan of Abraham Lincoln, but there's a way of looking at the United States war between the states because they refused to call it a civil war. Is that this was really a French and British color revolution attempt to split the North, to get the North and South to fight each other and split the South off and turn the South into a permanent colony of, of, of Europe. We, they were the raw, the raw commodity providers in the South. They had, we had the, the Europe had captured markets because of tariffs and rules and covenants and everything else. And the industrial North was angry about this. And so they put tariffs on the South in order to try and level the playing field. The goal, of course, was to strangle the American, burgeoning American industrial baby in the crib, right? And so that there was no competition between, you know, continental Europe and, and, and Britain. Makes perfect sense when you think of it in those terms. Now, Lincoln surviving, or the United States surviving as one country, was a failed color revolution in a, in a sense. It caused a civil war, caused the North and South to go to war for five years, and it caused the subjugation of the South by the North and reconstruction and all the horrors of that and and all the rest of it and and in no way matter shape or form am i absolving lincoln of of any of that and i'm my heart is still with the south hell i live in the south um but i i recognize that i I recognize that as one way of looking at the u.s civil war now that in a way that i didn't even five years ago so or the war between the states so now let's now let's think about that. When that failed, Britain had to change strategy. For 100 years, they were our greatest enemy. Mm-hmm. And then somehow right around the turn of the, the 20th century, they started to become our, they started to schmooze us and become our ally. Until we got, so they helped put globalists in charge of the American government, starting with Wilson. We got the League of Nations, which fails. We get, you know, everything else. But we get Wilson to go in to, not Wilson, sorry, Hoover. I always get those two mixed up because they both suck. Um, who, um, right. it's Herbert Hoover and the League of Nations. So take all the Wilsons, replace them with Hoover. I, I know my, my history. I just always, I always, always mix those two guys up. Um, but you get Wilson gives us World War I and then saves Britain's bacon because the Brits and the French had borrowed a tremendous amount of money from the United States, from American investors to fight World War I. 
And they needed the U.S. to come in at that point. And this is, I'm setting up what's happening today um, in order to finally win the war and guarantee the repayment of that debt. Okay. So, and this is partially what causes, of course, what causes the Treaty of Versailles, the, the, the German hyperinflation, and that 20 years of basically German humiliation, which leads to Hitler and everything else. And there's a French uh, general who, uh, famously said that, you know, the Treaty of Versailles wasn't a- an armistice. It was a 20 year ceasefire. Right. Right. So, right. so we're setting that up now because my friend, my good friend, Alex Craner, who, if you haven't spoken to Alex, you should absolutely have him on the show. I would because, love to. Yeah. And because what Alex figured out in, re- in recent days was, and he's published and he and I have talked about is that. The Bank of England is on the hook as the guarantor for a lot of Ukraine's World Bank debt. Okay. And now the Bank of England, by the way, if the Bank of England loses money, guess who's on the hook to guarantee that the repayment of the, of the losses to the Bank of England, the British Parliament, the British people. So there's about somewhere around 200 plus billion dollars worth of losses on the Bank of England's balance sheet from both the uh, the guilt crisis of 2022, which cost Liz Truss her job, that was about 160 billion, and then there's about 40 to 50 billion dollars worth of Ukraine debt that the Bank of England is guaranteeing that Ukraine is now defaulted on. As of August 1st, they defaulted on, and so the Bank of England is now in a very ugly position, and they and so Britain absolutely needs this war extended. We don't care about 50 billion dollars with the or the debt that the Brits that the Ukrainians owe us. We $50 billion every week. It doesn't matter. But for the Brits, that's literally, you know, 15% of, uh, of annual GDP. It's a lot of money. And yeah. it's, it's, it's for them and, and, and they're as fallen as they are, this is a problem. So they're running the same playbook, which is that the United States is going to have to come in and bail out Britain from their bad bets. Now, at the same time, BlackRock and JP Morgan and a lot of other American uh, companies and yes, the Rothschilds are involved in Ukraine and have guaranteed a lot of this debt as well. And they want the United States to come in and and fix this problem. Meanwhile, Putin is sitting on the other side, going, "Seen this playbook before? You guys did this to us." As a revolution, which was another British color revolution. One way one could look at it. Yeah, we're not going that route. So we're not going to give you your cookie. We're not going to give you World War Three. So. What what Putin keeps doing is taking a punch to the mouth, taking the the these escalations, the bombing of the Kerch Strait Bridge, the bombing of Nord Stream Two, the attack on the 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 the, the Opera House in Moscow, the 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 drone attack on a Moscow uh, apartment complex just last night or the night before, like he's taking those in 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 the he's taking those punches to the mouth, the Kursk invasion uh, incursion, and he's going look, we know how to play this. We've, we've watched them do this before. Yeah. And we're not, and we're just not going to take the bait. We're not going to give you a moral reason to create a just war to go into, to, to, uh, to escalate and start drafting your people and everything else. And the longer this goes on, the worse the ti- the, the financial noose tightens around the, the, the people of the West. So that's one angle on that as of October, uh, September, 2024. Let me ask you a question, if you don't mind, sure. about this. About this, and I, I'm sure. so sorry to interrupt you because I can no, just no, let you go. <laughs> if you let me go, the two hours will go by, <laughs> and well, I will have, still have not answered the original question. So it's fair. So I'm putting the dots together here. Mm-hmm. So when the war in Ukraine first started, and by the way, just so you know, a lot of these interviews they do so well, but I'm not sure this one will. This one might get blacklisted by YouTube. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had this conversation on YouTube a hundred times. So, it, okay. so as long as we it stay away, from well. search, it's not because it's not interesting. It usually does very well. Actually. Um, <laughs> uh, just so you know, I, I, I gave three of these yesterday. Then none of them have ever gotten blacklisted. But we'll, we'll, oh, see what well, we'll see. We'll see. I had one that with Andrew. No, who was it? Anyways, I had one that didn't do well. And I was like, that was bang up anyway. But anyways, so long story short, um, correct me if I'm wrong with this. Peace was on the table yes. right away with Ukraine and Russia. Mm-hmm. And who torpedoed that 
was Britain, if I'm not mistaken. But Britain and now Victoria Nuland has, has, has confirmed as of yesterday that the United States was involved in that as well. Yeah. Now, Newland so, and so, so people like Newland and Blinken, right? They're one, they're, they're both Ukrainians, FYI, or of Ukrainian extraction. <laughs> well, she can't make this up. No, you can't. With two, they've always mapped to U.S. neoconservatives like the Bill Crystals, the, 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 the Paul Wolfowitzes, the, the Rumsfeld, that neoconservative group, um, Project for New American Century, those guys. Um, they're always mapped directly to Britain, to British foreign policy and British, po British foreign policy um, uh, imperatives. Obama and those guys, and that whole wing of the Democrats maps more to the European Union and those globalists. They're not the same group of globalists, okay? Yeah. Like, and then within, within Britain, you have like the Tony Blairites and the Keir Starmers who map more to Europe than you do than, say, the David Camerons and the Boris Johnsons, okay? Well, David Cameron is probably more of a, of, a, a, of a European, but certainly not Boris Johnson, okay? And then, you know, like, people like um, ben, former um, Defense Secretary Ben Wallace and people like that, those are classic British neoconservatives. They are classic City of London first, everything else second kind, kind, uh, kind of folks. Um, they're okay with you know they're they're fundamentally different than um than the, those that are that want to reverse brexit and go rejoin the eu um they 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 just are and they all and then if they remember about neoconservatives they always back the dominant faction in order to get what they want because at the end of the day they're trotskyites they're permanent revolutionaries their goal is to destroy russia and they don't care who they graft themselves onto in order to get what they want Right. right. But Newland famously said the EU when it came to the Maidan, she had a different agenda than that. She all she cared about was overthrowing the Yanukovych um, government and installing her people, not people that the EU wanted. That's what that statement was made in context of, of who was going to be the guy who ran Ukraine after Yanukovych was was removed. OK. And she famously said, Yats, yeah, Yats is our guy. Uh, well, what about the EU? Fuck the EU. That's literally the conversation, right? So when you, so it, it's a very subtle thing, and it, and at, and and at times they may look like they're in cahoots together. They that they, they're all pulling on the same, you know, they're pulling pulling on the uh, on the same side of the tug of war, but they really aren't because this is like a four sided or five sided tug of war, like okay. honor among thieves, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. These and 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 neoconservatives are they have an agenda. And that agenda, which, by the way, also maps nicely to Zionism, but let's just keep it in, you know, just to make sure that everybody understands. I understand all of that, and I'm not, I'm not whitewashing it. I'm trying to keep it relatively clean for YouTube. Yeah. So let's now move on. Okay, so, man, you brought up so much stuff. So two yeah. things, <laughs> two questions then, and they're almost rhetorical, but I want you to answer them. Sure. Um, so I was amazed, not amazed, but I was very surprised that we're not in World War III right now with Russia. Mm. And I guess that explanation, and I want you to work that out a little bit more, but yeah, it, it works out why that isn't the case. That's number one. And number sure. two is Blinken. Mm -hmm. Are the likes of Blinken, I say likes because I'm assuming, and the Obamas, but the likes of Blinken, they're the ones that are running the country, no? Yeah, okay. So, yes. It, it, again, it, it's a little bit, you know, again, take everything I just said and now, under, now ask yourself the question, well, if the neoconservatives are the, you know, they have their agenda and Obama is nominally running the Biden administration, which he is. Uh, why would they, why would the, the Obama administration put a bunch of rabid neoconservatives in charge? Yeah. If they if they mapped the Davos. Why would they put a bunch of rabid neoconservatives in charge of foreign policy like Jake Sullivan and Blinken and Newland and everybody else? Well, clearly, because Europe wanted this, the EU and the Davosians wanted this war with Russia. They thought they were going to win. They were going to use the war for so everybody would get what they wanted. Right. And 
it's easy to get neoconservatives to go to war against Russia. It's easy. All you got to do is say, hey, would you like to go to war with the Russians? And they were like, yes, we would love to do that. That's the, that went Thursday. Thursday sounds great. And of course, Putin said, how about Monday? Yeah. And, and that's you know, and that's the and that's the difference. In the, and that's why the war has worked out the way it has. Now, yeah. with that in mind, it was always going to be a war on Europe's terms yeah. or Europe's goals. And Europe's goals are different than the neoconservatives. Europe just wants Russia weakened and they want cheap. They want those things. They want the cheap energy and the cheap lithium and they, they want the oil and the gas and everything else. And as Alex has pointed out, there were there are oil con and oil and gas and coal and and lithium contracts with you with with Ukraine going back to 2014, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of deals that were signed back in 2014 in anticipation of the Yanukovych overthrow and getting control of all of Ukraine. And the Donbass broke away. And that's where all the assets are. They're in the right. Sea of They're in the Eastern Black Sea. The, the, all the coal deposits are in the Donbass. All that coal that used to go to Germany now mm -hmm. goes to China, by the way. Right. And because the railroads literally go from the Donbass to China. Yep. They, and they've always been there. But in the past, they went to, they went to Europe because Putin's, and, and this is just to remind everybody, Putin's weakness is that he always saw Russia as a European country. So he always wanted to be part of the West. Yeah. He understood that Russia has to kind of sit in between the Chinese and the United States and that Europe is a kind of buffer zone. And, and it's better for Russia to have their feet in, you know, in both places and be kind of a, for Russia to survive, the best thing for Russia to do is to not really ally with either of them. So yeah, we sell the Germans cheap gas and oil and coal. We sell... We sell the Chinese cheap oil and cheap gas, and, and we do all of this, and we craft a rational security architecture for the entire continent. Hey, let's just make, let's just have trade and make babies. And that's been Putin's like strategy, and the West kept saying no, no, yeah. no, no. And it's only the Brit, and it's, and it's always come from the British, and it's always come from and at times during the like the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and early and, and certainly up through about 9-11 and up through say 2008, the United States was pushing Europe to do what we wanted them to do. But then that worm started to turn and the servant clearly wanted to become the master as they thought the whole thing was going to run and they were going to collapse all of the nation states of the West, move all the power to the UN and then create a new a new overarching of uh, financial and political architecture built on the EU model, transfer to the UN, and then that's how they were going to subjugate Russia, China, and everybody else by extending the financial control, the the financial control layer, up to the supernatural, supra national level. And at some point, they decided at Davos that they would cut the American banks out of this process. Okay, and so that, problem. that is and that's and this is where the quote unquote the thesis comes from. Okay, so they cut the American banks out of this big problem, right? It is. Well, think of it this way: when you talk about their push for wanting to create a CBDC, a programmable central bank digital currency, yeah, and yeah. that means that they want to do away with the commercial banking system, right? right? That the two that the two tier the two circle monetary monetary transmission system would collapse into one. As opposed to we're going from the central banks, from the central banks to the commercial banks, and then from the commercial banks to you and me, go straight to the central bank. Collapse that and make it from the central bank directly to you and me. And well, where does Wall Street fit into that? How does JP Morgan get their get, get their vig? How does Goldman Sachs make their money? How does this one right? And so at some point, the commercial as much as we all hate the banksters, right? And with good reason, we should hate them for a variety of things. It is the commercial banks of the United States that built the modern West. Without the commercial banking sector of the United States, there is no modern West. There is a, there is a bombed and broken Europe that has still not recovered from World War II. There is no, and there is no 1950s. There is no Cold War. There is no, there's, and unfortunately, yes, we also had to accept the military-industrial complex, the IC blob, all of these other things that are going along with it, that that empowered 
But that's because we made the choice to embrace a new British empire model centered in Washington as opposed to city of London. We accepted that choice. God. Okay. That's our sin as Americans. Okay. So, okay. but at the same time, once they then turned around and said, well, we've, we took all the capital that we sent to the United States during world wars one and two and built the United States with all of our money. Cause that's what the Europeans did. They moved all their money into the United States. They built all the factories, they built all the banks, they did all this shit. And then what to do, what to build the United States up and then throw it right back at the Russians during world war two. Nominally, we had to actually clean up their mess, which is they created Germany. They created Hitler because they created Hitler's. They wanted Hitler to go fight the Russians. Hitler went, you know what? You and he attacked in both directions. And then they had to, and then, and then we had to, we ab absolutely at that point had to clean everybody's mess up. Um, and that's one version of reality on the story. I know I'm simplifying. It's they're not, no, no, none, it's of, great. These, none she, of these historical periods are this simple. I'm yeah. like, this is, of but course. this is one version of the, of history that we never talk about. Right. right. So of course. when you look at it from that perspective, their goal was always to take all that capital and send it all back to Europe to rebuild Europe. And then when they were done, hollow out the United States, unlike the good locusts that they are, the good colonial locusts that they are, at a certain point, collapse the US and the money all flows back to Europe. And then they get to be king shit of the hill again. And they've destroyed Russia and they have all their energy. They've subjugated, resubjugated the Middle East. They have all of their energy. The U.S. is then still their, um, their, their, their gendarme or, you know, their bobbies and they're running around South, Central and South America taking and Africa taking out there. And that was their plan. It was always the plan. It was very obvious when the WEF came out and started saying the everything that they were saying the wef was saying everything they were saying we're going to do away with private property we're going to do away with all this we're going to do away with all that you're going to own nothing and be happy you're going to rent we're we're going to force you to rent your life back from us for pennies on the dollar and they're like you know what fuck you no and i'm sorry but jamie diamond like this i can't i just i smoke these cigars and i'm sitting there going i'm jamie diamond i'm sitting in my chair like this and there's like john solomon from goldman and whoever's running morgan today and all the rest of it they sit around and they talk so uh, this Klaus Schwab guy, this, I think it's, he's a little big for his fucking britches, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. And that, and that Fink guy over at BlackRock, who's their, who's their little poodle? What's BlackRock actually worth? Uh, it checks up the balance sheet. I think about $40 billion worth of, worth of shareholder equity. Or, well, dude, that ain't shit. Like, I know. Why don't we just buy it? Why don't we just collapse that and then, like, and make Fink our bitch? How do we do that? Oh, how do we do that? We call up our friend over at the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, who works for us and says, raise interest rates to five and a half percent, collapse these motherfuckers. Yeah, that's how it worked. That's what happened, folks. It's, it's not that difficult. You just have to sit around and think like these people. And you're like, yeah, no, we're not doing it. Okay. And the, and the way that, and the reason that it happened was because Trump got elected yeah. And they were able to install Powell at the Fed, who was always a hawk, all during the Bernanke and Yellen years. He's sitting there going, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> what is this nonsense? But he has to inherit bad Federal Reserve policy put in place by Bernanke and Yellen, and then it's slowly but surely ex extricate ourselves from this. Now we can make the argument that COVID was nothing more than a big operation to go to, to collapse the U.S. bond market and force yeah. the Fed back to the zero bank. Get get Trump to sign off on the CARES Act and spend ten trillion dollars, and then and, and, and then force Powell, and then run out the rest of Powell's first term, and then not give him a second term. Yeah, which is what they tried to do, and they failed. Yeah. Okay. So, so well, so, what, so the only reason that so the only reason why Powell is still in place is because Wall Street put their hand on the backs of certain people to say, don't do this, don't do this, don't let that happen, don't let that happen, and we'll take care, and we'll put Powell in for another, another four years. And then we, had, and we have monetary. So you have, we're in control of monetary policy in the United States. They're in control of political policy. They need both in order to run their plan, and we're going to stop them for, for five years, and that should be long enough, six years, and that should be long enough. Yeah. That's the way I see it strategically. Well, I'm glad you said that. Because it made me think of like going through all of this and gaming this out, if you would, and it, and it is a game, I see it. 
um, why would you raise interest rates for 18 months in a row when you were at pretty much at zero to what, five and a half right now? That right. makes almost time to me. It does make sense. It's actually good for the, the greenback and blah, 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 blah. It should be done, but it, I'm not seeing this as people that have the highest ethics <laughs> to do this. They're not doing well, this for the, for the country. That's no, the no, they, yeah, they're doing it for themselves, but they're also doing it in, in a sense. Remember, I don't think, like, at the end of the day, J.P. Morgan doesn't care where they invest in a pipeline. Right. They don't care if it's in the Donbass. They don't care if it's in Dubuque, Iowa. Right. right? They don't care. As yeah. a matter of fact, if you really listen to Jamie Dimon talk, he would rather invest in Dubuque, Iowa. Right. He'd rather rebuild the interstates. He'd rather rebuild the, the railroads. He'd rather, you know, he'd rather do it here. He's, I don't doubt Diamond's, you know, nominal patriotism at that level. I think it's pretty obvious. I mean, there's no reason. But he, at the end of the day, you also have to realize that they are ruthless people who understand the, the lay of the land. Yeah. And if the political winds are shifting against them, they, in order to survive, you stay, you shift with the political winds. Yeah. When the ship, when the political winds shift the other direction, then you take your opportunity. Yeah. And that's, I think the best way of, of, uh, of, of, of looking at this. It's not that they're, I mean, I think, look, Jerome Powell is an eighth generation American. Okay. He traces his lineage back to the freaking Mayflower practically. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Like, there are, there are some people in this country who are race traders and there are other people who are not. I don't just don't think that Jerome Powell is, you know, he's, I just don't think he's a European. I think he's a private equity guy. He believes in America and he believes, and he may be a Keynesian, right? In his economic thinking. So, okay. So he's not perfect. He's not an Austrian or not, so, you know, some version of Austrian. Fine. But at some point, like Keynesianism fails and you got to do the right thing. And the, and, and, the Fed at the zero bound is not a central bank. Daniel DiMartino and Booth makes this point all the time. She's absolutely correct about it. The Fed at the zero bound is not a central bank. It's just a euro dollar generation system. And the euro dollar system, the offshore dollar system, is the monetary policy setting agency of the world and of the, uh, of the dollar. And therefore, and that's what we had with Bernanke, Yellen, and to a lesser extent, mm -hmm. even Greenham. Now, that's a great um, point. And Powell is says, I'm going to five and a half percent. What's the Fed's the one thing the Fed has, the one superpower the Fed has? And this is uh, this is a point that, you know, uh, a talking point of the, the, the way we, 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 we gestated it actually came from Dexter White, my partner in Gold Goats and Guns. He said, well, yeah, you know, the, the real punk rock is the fact that the Fed can raise interest rates. Like, you know, otherwise they're just a bunch of euro trash. You know, there's just flock of seagulls. Like the, you know, right. But, you know, the I real punk the rock. <laughs> so, I, this is literally the way he put it to me one day because we're both 80s, 80s kids. He's like, so when the, they're just, you know, they're just flock of seagulls. But, you know, when they go to what, if they decide to raise interest rates and they cut back on, on global credit, now they're the sex pistols. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, right. so seriously. And, or, you know, like I, I got Jello Biafra as the freaking Fed chair, right? <laughs> So that's perfect. That's perfect. So when you, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, we are good at what we do, right? Um, so when you think of it, we're that the same way, age. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he, he and I are, he and I are in our, our you know, our mid fifties, right? Yeah. Um, so when you, when you look at it that way, all the Fed had to do was do that. So all of this like big Euro dollar stuff that Jeff Snyder talks about, and I hate to throw Jeff under the bus, but he frankly deserves it because he didn't see the shift. Right. And then I have to ask the, I have to, you know, he taught me all about the euro dollar system. And then when the, when the shift occurred and Powell's like, no, we're cutting, we're, we're, we're destroying the leverage within the euro dollar system and we're bringing, and we're going to repatriate the capital to back to the United States. And we're going to start aligning a federal, a federal reserve policy with a revitalized United States. That's when everything went into overdrive. Got it. So you get Powell is installed at the Fed in 2017. Right after that, he moves John Williams into the New York Fed. New John Williams, who's the architect of SOFR, the secured overnight financing rate, is installed at the powerful New York Fed to, to oversee the five-year rollout of SOFR. 
So part of the reason why they needed to get rid of Powell is because SOFR was going to be the law of the land by January 1, 2022. And they wanted to get rid of Powell before that happened. His term would expire before that. Put Lael Brainerd in, in, in charge, kill SOFR in its crib, keep the power in LIBOR or some version or, your, or move it from, Li, from London to Frankfurt and make it Eurobor. Same thing, mm -hmm. right? And at the end of the day, and then, um, and then that way, the United States never has control over the cost of offshore dollars. Europe remains in control of the, of the price of offshore dollars, not us. Because all that money is over there. Yeah. And at the zero bound, you get infinite leverage within the, within the offshore dollar system. And then you have the Bank of Japan is captured. They have to continue doing QE and they and go to the go to the negative bound and everything else. So there's just all this massive, massive amount of leverage in the system. And Powell, but what 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 got me thinking this way was when Powell raised the reverse repo payout rate five basis points above the Fed funds rate in June of 2021. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, I didn't understand what that meant at the time. I had no idea what he I barely I, I still had to go to Investopedia. What the fuck is a is a reverse repo? What's a repo? What's a reverse repo? I don't, I didn't understand any of this stuff, but I understood the euro moving three cents in 48 hours. Yeah. That's what I understood. And that's crazy. And went, too. Right. The euro went from $1.22 to $1.19 in from two o'clock on a Wednesday to five o'clock on Friday that week. Yeah. And through, and then, you know, and then technically through a one bar weekly reversal, which then turned into a monthly reversal, which then turned into a quarterly reversal. And then all of a sudden I'm like, Okay, what in the hell is going on here? Yeah. And then I go back and I think about all the things that I'd heard in the year leading up to that. I listened to Martin Armstrong talking about how Schwab wants to get rid of the commercial banking system. And I talk and and I hear and I go back to Powell going to the Green Sea Summit two weeks earlier and telling Christine Lagarde, uh, no, the Federal Reserve's job is not to make the world safe for climate change. The Federal Reserve's job is its dual mandate of stable prices and full employment. And then Lagarde was like literally fulminating, like, who is this guy that he has, a, has the right to tell me what to do? And I went, could Jerome Powell actually be a good guy in this? <laughs> and I'm like Dr. Austrian at this point. I'm like, Trader <laughs> Gober kind of guy. Like, seriously. Yeah. And yeah. I went, wait, wait, no, wait. And then it all just hit me like a wave, like literally over a 48 hour period. I went, if this, then that, and if this, then that, and maybe I'm wrong, but what if, well, okay, if that's going to happen, if I'm right about that, then we're going to see somebody put his hand on the back of some important senator to stop Build Back Better. Because Build Back Better was the mechanism by which they were going to force Powell back to the Keep Powell at the zero bound because they're print six trillion. They're all lying through their teeth about how it was how it was revenue neutral, and they're like, no. And then the and then the CBO report said, "There's Joe Manchin, the Kirsten Cinema both going. Well, I don't know if I want to vote for this until after I see the CBO report about how much it's going to actually cost." And both are like, "We have to vote for it." And then she like lops all of these other all like all three bills into one, like the debt ceiling, the Build Back Better, and the infrastructure right. bill, all into one vote. And that's a classic power move to try and blackmail uh, squishy Republicans into voting for an increase in the debt ceiling. They really get what they wanted across the board. Mm -hmm. And then the CBO report comes out and lies and, and the lies are exposed that this thing's going to cost $6 trillion over the first um, two years, but then we'll be revenue neutral after that or something like that. Right. right. And Joe Manchin was like, okay, I can't vote. Yeah, but Joe doesn't do that without somebody standing behind him and going, "Don't worry about it. Your kids aren't going to be killed. Don't yeah. worry about it. You do this. We've got your back." That doesn't happen otherwise. That's the way it works in Washington. It's all big freaking mafia stuff. Yeah, and Italian. I kind of know a little bit about this. <laughs> so, like, I watch The Sopranos. I'm like, this is this is sadly accurate. I can't watch this anymore. Um, so, you know. Once you understand how to read politics, and I, and I understood this, I knew how to read politics. I knew how to see how the markets and the policy were then, okay, but I also knew how to read politics and knew how to read the political figures. So it's a unique set of skills, I guess, that allowed me to just go and then to be willing to go, well, maybe I'm wrong about what I saw because that's not working. So what's going on here?
And so that was the generation of it all and the gestation of it all. And then after that, it was just constantly getting little confirmatory bits of data. Listen. And then every day I'd wake up and I'd look at the, I'd look at the capital markets and I'd look at the, the, the news flow and I go, oh, look, huh. Well, another Minolta Volta that. drop, another, another this drop, another that drop. And I kept, yeah. and by December, I'm like, oh, I'm so right about this. And well, when I had Daniel that. DiMartino booth on my podcast that January, I got yeah. her to, in effect, confirm that confirm. I was right about this. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm good. To, I'm good to go from here. So I had her on a couple months ago. She's very, she's very sharp. But, anyways, what I'm, she's my amazing. question is this. My point is this, and it mm -hmm. works with your thesis. And just thinking about it, the regional bank failures, right? Let's collapse the regional banks. Well, have we noticed that the regional banks haven't really collapsed? Well, that was that's the thing, right? Work that out for me. They were supposed to have collapsed, but they, they were supposed, supposed to collapse. have collapsed. Right. And they didn't. I mean, right. it's interesting that it hasn't happened. But it is interesting that four regional banks all collapsed that were regulated by the San Francisco Fed. Yeah. yeah. And then they were all bought by banks of the New York Fed. Hmm, I wonder how that <laughs> happened. And these were all, all turns out to be that all turns out to be banks that were oligarch banks, you know, uh, uh, wandering money for George Soros and, and Zuckerberg and all, all the big tech guys to influence our elections and buy DAs and all the rest of this stuff. Like, this is what was going on. Yeah. FTX was executed on yeah. election night 2022. Right. It woke up the next morning and there, you know, the Republicans didn't. You know, there wasn't a red wave and FTX had exploded. And I, I was already on that story by going, you know, know, all summer long, we watched all of these stable coins blow up. Right. I wonder who did that. I'm like, and it was then that one, that one was really obvious because yeah. Letitia James gave Tether a slap on the wrist and let him go. Yeah. And all the other, all the other stable coins got, got destroyed. I'm like, oh, that's obvious. Another uh, one of my one of my uh, one of my patrons did a correlation analysis and found and and found that like Bitcoin and Tether were yeah there was clear like like there was some clear collateralization of the repo markets happening with Bitcoin so Bitcoin needed to stay liquid so I just sort of I go well you know obviously Bitcoin doesn't trade against dollars it trades against Tether ninety nine right. percent of uh, of Bitcoin trades so you got to leave one stable coin that you control. That's a that's a sink for hundreds of billions of dollars of U.S. Treasuries, right? Yep, yep. Okay, and to, to keep Bitcoin liquid, and that made perfect sense to me. So the Fed and 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 that was a that was a hypothesis back then. That's been confirmed since then. Yeah. Okay. Tether so here is here is my last question, and again, well, I have two more questions. Bricks, oh, God. in response to all of this, and again, we could spend two hours just on bricks alone for two days. Just we could spend two more hours on just the whole the whole Federal Reserve thing. Like this is yeah, a lot. Right. There's a lot to take in here, and I and yeah. I'll give you as much time as you want here. I don't have anything else going on my schedule for the rest of the day. So I've got another. You know, we've been going about forty five minutes. If you want to go another forty five, that's fine with me. I don't have a problem. Okay. So, well, we'll go as long as. As, as we can. I mean, yeah, I do have to go somewhere in about 45 minutes, but that being all said, right. talk to me about BRICS in response to all of this. Well, the BRICS are, yeah, the, well, the BRICS are very simple. I'm going to actually I'll keep this answer short. <laughs> Russia never wanted to be thrown out of the SWIFT system. Yeah. They, right. were, they were forced. They were forced they to cut to deals with China. Right. They, right. Like the Just Russians the didn't, the Russians didn't want to create power of Siberia one and two. Right. Like they didn't want to do this, but they were forced to. And the BRICS were forced into, you know, they were forced into that, in, into organizing. Just like, you know, when, but when you think about it, like cartels like that are not natural. OPEC is not natural. And yet somehow OPEC is now BROPEC plus. We've added Brazil and Russia. And now we got BROPEC plus, not, not OPEC. Why? Right. OPEC should have collapsed by now. But because we keep pressuring the oil markets, because we keep trying to make oil uninvestable and to destroy it. Of course, the oil producers continue to respond yeah. to that pressure by coming together and defending themselves. Great right? answer. Great point. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. now Russia's doing this. The Russia's been doing the same thing. And that's basically what the BRICS are doing. The BRICS have been told 
we don't want you as me as members of the dollar system unless you completely knuckle under. And they're all like, well, no, we're not going to do that. We don't have to. We're not going to. And that's fine. And we're going to leave. And so now they're just build building a parallel system. And since they control the commodities flow, they control the collateral, most of the collateral being oil and gold, and natural gas and coal and titanium and uranium and aluminum and everything else. And they have the manufacturing base over in China now that they that has never been there before. Remember, go back to my, my discussion about the Civil War, about the U.S. Civil War. The only industrial center of the world at that point was Europe. So everybody had to, and Europe has always acted, and the United States have always acted as we are the center Great of point. the industrial universe first. <laughs> so therefore, we get to decide, we get to tell you what the price of your commodities are. Yeah. Now they can institute a new commodity settled system because they've got industrial um, they've got industrial powerhouses in China, the Asian yeah. Tiger Five, and uh, around the world. So now the the down the dark side of globalism was that globalism sent all the capital around the world, democratized industrial production, mm -hmm. and then now it now it can be bifurcated. What what the what the assholes with the Davos crowd, whatever you want to call them. I, I'm now starting to just call them evil corp central. Um, maybe I'll just start calling them the Legion of Doom because I'm, I'm a DC guy. Um, uh, that's uh, not a Marvel guy. Fuck Marvel. Um, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, that over at evil corp central, what they were planning on doing was doing exactly what they'd always done, which was they sent all their money into China. They built China up and they were they expecting to get regulatory capture of China and then use that to undermine the CCP, undermine the, the, the Chinese system, but and control China through by saying, we have all your money in there. We'll threaten to pull our money out and, you know, fuck you. And um, and then we can we, we can collapse China as we want to. This is what we've done in every other country around the world. They always thought they were going to be able to do it um, this time. And China refused to open their capital account. And China's refusal to open their capital account is actually why they were able to continue to, to do this. Meanwhile, at the same time, you know, the West was tightening the noose around themselves, tying themselves up into this debt spiral they couldn't get out of. And they kept having to run, you know, go to the zero bound and the negative bound. And China's like, well, fine, we'll just keep running our little Merkel and Tullis playbook for as long as we can. Oh my God, you're still going to let us do this for another 15 years. What are you out of your minds? Right. And so now, um, the, and the, and G comes to power, Putin comes to power. They cut deals on, on collateral and they start just building in a parallel system because technology yep. has, has, has reached the point where, you know, and Jim Sinclair to, to, you know, God's rest his soul told everybody back in 2008, nine, when Obama first started uh, threatening the Swiss with swift expulsion over their, their privacy banking privacy he said you go nuclear like swift is not a hard thing to reproduce it's just freaking code right it's not hard and that's and what so did. and that's and that's what everybody did it was just a smart thing to do and and then you know and the more pressure and the more we sanction people the more we use the magnitsky act and all the shit from bill browder and all those fucking assholes over at mi6 the more that 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 pressure was used they, kept, they didn't understand the people were doing this did not really understand that the more pressure you put on those systems, the more they're, you're incentivizing them to build alternative systems. And that's exactly what they've done. Now, you want to, you want to kill the bricks? Lift all the sanctions. Start acting like normal people. Stop trying to promote World War III and outcompete them. Right. Yep. Like, how, I mean, how hard is it to outcompete the Russian economy? Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm massively impressed with what Putin's done and I'm, you know, and, and, and everything else. But at the end of the day, the Russian economy is not all that efficient still. It's still yeah. a hotbed of corruption and everything else. It hasn't yeah. had to reform because yeah. it's being, it's being pushed into this path. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So my really work this out for me then mm -hmm. is where are we at now? I mean, again, this is very 30,000 foot view. I mean, I'm saying this not with an expectation or because I don't know where we're at. Um, well, I do. I have an idea where we're at, but mm -hmm. um, not so much what's happening tomorrow, but right. where are we at? Where are we at? We're at the inflection point where 
if they know that if Trump gets reelected, He's going to start dismantling the administrative state in the United States, which is the means by which they're trying to collapse the U.S. Okay. The Brits are some number of days before they start defaulting. The, the, the markets are, will start looking at them going, look, guys, you've got to figure out what you're going to do here. Um, the Ukrainians want to sue for peace. They're not being allowed to. The Russians will continue to put pressure on Ukraine by keeping the war at the current level of escalation and not responding to, um, you know, the, these provocations by Blinken and, and the rest of them. China is hoping that Trump gets elected because they know that with Trump in the, in the White House, um, that a deal can get cut, right, on tariffs and currencies and, you know, bond deals and, and investment and all the rest of it. The United States is moving towards a rebuilding and reindustrializing. We're seeing that with chip plants being built all over Arizona and Idaho and other places. It's happening. But they want it to happen. But that's happening at the same time as long as it serves Davos's purpose of creating an AI run future, those things are we're allowed to do that, but we're not allowed to build, you know, you know, a, a stable, a really stable electrical grid. They just want to be able to run servers and build chips and whatnot and take that ca capacity away from China because China refuses to play ball but, yeah. on that front. So um, someone needs to start a just war over Ukraine. They tried to turn Ukraine into a just war at the outset. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. They now need to do it for real. They still want the United States to fight that war. The Pentagon doesn't want to fight that war. Lloyd Austin's over there. Literally, I mean, you ask him where we are today. Where, the things that have happened in the last 48 hours tell you what's going on. The State Department, run by the, by the Ukrainian mafia, um, Blinken, Newland, and the rest of them, um, all want war. Yes. And so they sent Blinken and David Lammy over to Kiev to say, yeah, you can, we give you the blessing to shoot missiles deep into Moscow, into Russia. Yes. Meanwhile, the, Lloyd Austin goes to meets with Zelensky at the Ramstein Air Base in Germany and says, yeah, you're not getting anything from us. So while Blinken can give you permission, we're not giving you the weapon. So you go, go get those weapons from the Brits or the Germans or somebody else. Olaf Scholz says, hey, oh, by the way, after Saxony and Thuringia vote a, basically AFD slash CDU and the Green Mafia, which has been running, which Davos and which Merkel and a coalition of Davos and um, the Brits put in charge by giving them veto power in the German upper house, Saxony and Thuringia and probably Brandenburg are going to take that veto away from the Greens, meaning that depowers them dram dramatically and no longer is Robert Habeck and Annalena Baerbock running Germany, but now Scholz can actually run his own government. What does that mean? Well, you saw two things have already happened. First, Scholz closed the border because he's trying to save the SPD from a wipeout in Brandenburg. The second is that he's now calling for peace talks with Russia at the table. Mm -hmm. Which has never happened before. So clearly, the EU has decided to start moving, as Germany is a proxy for the EU, has started to move away from active war with Ukraine, and they just want to now build back better in Europe. And that's why Mario Draghi came out yesterday with his big thing, saying we need to spend $800 billion a year for the next 20 years uh, to rebuild Europe. France and Germany want their own military industrial complex in a post-NATO world where they're no longer part of NATO. And the Brits are being left. And, then, and, and so then the neocons are having to go trundle off to Kiev to try and keep their dreams of World War III alive. Whereas, so this is what I meant at the beginning, that everybody's incentives look like they're the same at the outset, but it's like they have, the, they're like ships that pass the night on the, on the Venn diagram. Like we're, one's moving in this direction, another moving in that direction for a period of time. They're all over the target. But then once they don't, they don't reach the target. Now they're still doing their thing. They're still doing their thing. And now they're, and now they're working across purposes. And you're starting to see the beginnings of that. And we're, yeah. that's where we are right now. There's still the possibility that the whole thing still collapses because now 
what comes in the what comes in the focus. Putin's smartly running this as a war of attrition to expend all the political and economic and social capital of the governments in the West for fighting the war in Ukraine by just running a war of attrition and just grinding this thing out the way Russians always fight war. The Russians know how to fight war in, in Ukraine. It's you just grind it out until there's nobody left. That's what they always done too. They've always, they, they, they know, like telling, you know, th- thinking that you were going to blitzkrieg across Russia, like the, the Germans couldn't do it. Napoleon right. couldn't do it. Yep. Ukraine was never going to do it. Yeah. Like Putin would have just nuked the entire friggin' Donbass if he thought, the, he thought that was going to happen. Like that was never mm-hmm. going to happen, which is why he went first. So he yep. put NATO on the defensive, having to retake territory that they never expected to have to take in the first place. We expected to go in with a lightning strike, attack the Donbass, attack Crimea, and win. Yeah. And Putin beat us to the punch because Putin's not stupid. He's been in the martial arts ring before. He knows that if you want to, if you want to score that point, you go first. Yeah. You know, like it's not tough. And I've been in the martial arts ring. I know what that looks like. And you, you want to win that fight. That's how you do it. You go first. When you know the fight's inevitable, you set the terms of the engagement. Very Sun Tzu, very simple. And then if you don't get everything you want, which he didn't get the decapitation strike against Kiev, fine. Then you pull everything back. And you settle into a long, ugly, slow, grind it out, war of attrition, and you bleed them white. Meanwhile, yep. you continue. Now, is this going to co- is this costing Russia? Of course it is. Is it? And the West thinks that it can still bleed Russia white. At least the neocons still think that. They're wrong. <laughs> and because the Russians aren't acting by themselves anymore, which is now why we're, of course, now trying to put sanctions on Chinese banks to get them to stop supporting Russia's war machine, blah, 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 blah. And if we do that and Kamala Harris wins, she's going to do that. Okay. And then we're going to be forced into a situation where this could get, you know, someone is going to escalate this. And, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, the Pentagon's like, we can't fight this war that you want us to fight. Right. Like we can barely, we can barely field the two aircraft carriers in the, that are in cur- currently in the Gulf supporting Israel. Yeah. Like we don't have the supply, supply lines like we had in the past. And it's not about big military lift anymore. It's yeah, about drones. Yeah. It's about drone warfare and everything else. And that's what we've come. And so the, the Pentagon knows this. And it's not like we can't produce drones, right? It's not like we couldn't do this, but. Well, so can everyone look at that? Yeah. Well, what are we looking at then? What we're looking at is at some point, you know, everybody's just going to have, if this thing's just going to continue to grind on until somebody finally steps in and goes, that's enough. So I don't know how this plays out beyond that. I, I always have Martin Armstrong in the back of my head saying, this is going to be the last election we have in the U.S. That and then there's the, the other same- part. And the so, other, well, and who's that? Who's saying that? Simon and Hunt said the same thing. I had yeah, him and, on. Come on, yeah, and, and I, I, and I've been, I've been prepping for the end of the United States since I don't know, two thousand five, personally, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah, I used to draw up maps when I was when I when I worked in private industry, like as a hobby. I was like, okay, how would the how would the country break up? I had to like break it up into seven different countries for Christ's sake. Um, but I, it, it's. The, 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 the point of all of this, of everything I've said today, if you take, if you tie everything that I've, I, I, I've, 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 uh, I've said into a big bow in the TLDR, it's what I've been saying for three years. The target is the U.S. bond market. Yes. The target is the U.S. bond market. If you can destroy the U.S. Treasury market, if you can break the United States up so that no one, so that everybody's fighting over who guarantees the debt, then that capital leaves the United States and goes other places. Yeah. Europe is trying to set it up so that it goes there. Mm-hmm. China is sitting there going, we'll take it, but we're not ready. I mean, we could be ready for it, but we don't want to be ready for it. This is not a world that any of us really want. So where does that capital go? And this is why I'm like, while, they, while the United States is has been pushed into this moment of, ir- of irreconcilable differences between the woke and east to left and the maggotard right, nominally, nominally. 
the real power that exists in the U.S. is saying no. Because they understand that's the banking cartel, that's the MIC, that's the, it's the, the bigger problem here is the, even the IC blob has to realize that if this is broke, that if this breaks, where's the money going to come from to continue to do what you're doing? Because it's not going to be there unless, of course, you think you're going to be able to push everybody into 15 minute cities and make us eat bugs and put all of our money and just steal all of our money and put it on our phones. And Good news for you. That's just not going to happen. What we'll what we'll wind up with is a very ugly authoritarian future that is a hodgepodge of all of the things that Davos has like kind of laid out for us. And none of that is going to be um none of that is is going to be good for anyone. And uh so at the in the end of the day, I really do think Trump is going to wind up not only challenging and winning in some way whatever that i don't know what that word looks like you know i can't define what winning looks like in this scenario because it's not going to be on election night right he's not going to win the election on november 5th okay he may declare victory but so is kamala harris they're both going to declare victory and they're both going to declare that the election is invalid and i don't see the 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 election and being resolved until at least january if not later and there's going to be a lot of ugly stuff that happens between now and then. And they have their plans for it, right? Mm-hmm. What I expect is a big, I expect a liquidity crisis somewhere. I expect a false flag to support that liquidity crisis. And um, and I expect unbelievable levels of, of perfidy. And beyond that, I don't know how it, I don't know how it, the, I don't know what the outcome of all that is, right? I can't predict that. No one can predict that, to be honest with you. So, well, because there's too many some... variables, there's too much chaos. But yeah. I know who's I know who's backing each side now, and you can see them. You can see them making their moves to win. I don't know who's going to win. Like, yeah. And this could this gets down to I could like make a I can make a dumb board game reference and go. This is like a game of Agricola, and it's going to be. And do I? And I'm sitting there. Do I go for the first player marker so I can go first next turn so that I can get to the three wood spot before the other guy does? Or do I just take the four wood that's on the spot now and try and make the best of it? I don't know because I can't see that far ahead. Like it's one of those weird moments, right? And that's the best I can do for you. For those of you who've ever played a curriculum, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And for the three people in the audience who have. No, I'll take it. And I really do see it as a, a board game, if you would. Um, Yeah. And there's just multiple, there's multiple outcomes and it's just impossible yeah. to say what exactly is the outcome. Um, the, so the, maybe the, maybe the, be, maybe the better, maybe the better way of looking at it is that you're playing a game that has hidden information. Like I should go for that spot now, but I don't know what cards you have in your hand. Yeah. Right. And what cards could you play to counter me? And I think I, I have, I have an idea of what cards you have, but if you have that card, I'm fucked. And if you don't have that card, I win. And that, I think that's kind of where we are. Uh, And everybody is like trying to figure out, you know, can I go for the win now or not? And uh, I have a better, I have a, I have an even more esoteric game that actually models that much, much better, but that's a different discussion for a different day. So um, we'll end on that, but Simon, let me say Simon Hunt, I had him on. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He's yeah, still on similar things yeah. as you did, yep. as well as uh, Dave Cullum mm-hmm. had him on. He sounded very similar. Um, so it was interesting. But Tom, yeah, no. well, I, people, I'm a huge fan of your work. If people Thank want you. to reach out to you um, and go to your website, go ahead and give that to us. Sure. It's uh, you can go to TomLuongo.me or goldgoatsandguns.com. Uh, they go to the same place. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at TFL1728. Um, and uh, my DMs are open. So if somebody needs to get a hold of me for whatever reason, you just do so. I may or may not respond depending on what you ask. Um, and uh, then of course, there's the Patreon, which is where all the, which is how we make a living uh, at uh, Patreon slash Gold Goats and Guns. We do, I do twice weekly market reports on Wednesdays and Sundays where I go over the state of the markets as well as, um, you know, you know, my look ahead is to what I think is I'm seeing in the in in the, the zeitgeist on every Wednesday and every Sunday, as well as the uh, monthly newsletter where we have a whole portfolio strategy and we look ahead as to where we're going next. And that's where the 
that's where the, the look ahead goes. And, I, I, and then sometimes I do private blog posts and private podcasts and whatnot. But for the most part, you know, right now I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to save my energy for what's going to happen after November, to be honest with you. So, yeah. Well, I would thank you so much for your yeah. energy. Um, I immensely enjoyed that. I immensely enjoyed it. Good. I'm glad All it was right. fun. I enjoyed it. I, I, I love the, the weird part about this, Andy, is that I love talking about this stuff. I, I, I can do. tell, but it's good though, too. It's really well, good. I, I enjoy listening. Well, and the other thing about it is that the more you talk it, th- more you talk through it, and the more people ask you certain questions to clarify, then sure, yeah. new ideas pop into your head. I, I, I've done many podcasts where I stop and I go, "Oh, that's oh, what that got it. And then it yeah. happens in real time, and it's really cool. So, yeah. well, that's what happened to me now. Is like regional banks. Right. Yeah. Well, the re- I, 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 again, the last the last point about the regional bank thing is that Powell put things in place to help smooth that over, yeah. and you know those holes in their balance sheets over, and he set up a virtuous cycle to allow the the money to come back in to the to to the regional banks and allow them to capitalize themselves slowly without bailing them out. Yeah, and that is the real trick. And that's not that they're in trouble; they still have troubles. They're still going to take time to work off those holes in their balance sheet. He's going to cut interest rates here. I think mildly, and yeah. then we'll see what he does, and then we'll see what happens after that. Yep. All right, Tom. Thank you so much for your time. Take care, Andy. Be well. Be back.